That's a good Friday to you. Thank you for joining us online. So let me read two passages of scripture before I begin, and you can read it aloud with me, what is projected on the screen. And the first passage is taken from Matthew chapter 26, uh, verses 38 to 39. And this is at the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus said to Peter, James, and John, and Jesus said, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little bit farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible that this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And the second passage is taken from John chapter 19, verses 28 to 30, and this is where Jesus is at the cross. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, and they put a sponge full of the sour wine on the hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come right now and tutor us, Lord, in our hearts and our minds. That, Lord, your word, God, may not only inform our mind and inspire our hearts, but it will instruct, Lord, the way we live our life. And we pray all this, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for joining us on this Good Friday, and I pray that God will speak into your heart and let this be a good Friday for each of us. Now, I hold in my hand the ubiquitous uh, iPhone, and Apple has sold more than 900 million of these phones. We have the iPhone, the iPod, the iPad, the iTunes, and it's the world of I. The first time the letter was used by Apple on an iMac, it simply means internet. But later when the late Steve Jobs was asked what the letter I meant, he said two words come to his mind, individuality and inspiration. It's all about personalizing the power of technology and individualizing it. It's basically saying for every person, I am in control. I hold something in my hand to do what I want to do, how I want to do it, and when. And that's control in our hands. There are about 2 million iPhone apps available, and billions of apps have been downloaded into personal devices like this. And we are definitely under the influence of this new drug, I call it, of choice, because we can't leave home without it. Whether we are lying on our beds, having meals, walking, or even driving. You know, you have an app for everything in life, 24-7, at your fingertips. But a study has been shown that we check our phones every 12 minutes, and I think you do that as well. It's a, I want it, and I want it now culture at our fingertips. It is encouraging a culture of individualism and consumerism, what I can get and not what I can give. And all this comes from a longing for something in our lives, hopefully to satisfy the deep thirst in each of us. And only God has an app for that. I hope we realize that. That's because Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth, experienced everything we as humans experience so that he could give us what we deeply need. And so let's go back to the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed, and then he was arrested and he went to the cross. And there were recorded for us the last seven sayings of Jesus while he hung there in these six hours while he was, being, while he was alive. And the last words of dying people are significant. And I believe if you listen to them, you will listen to them attentively. Their words reflect who they really are inside. Last words differ from person to person because people live differently and they die differently. If a person lives with hope, he generally dies with hope. And if a person lives a life of despair, then they often die the same way too. So here are the seven last sayings of Jesus. His last words, his greatest short sermons, I call them. And they are important not because Jesus said to them, but not, not, not because what Jesus said, all right, but from where he said them, hung on the cross, a position of deep vulnerability, helplessness, and sufferings. 
And the cross is the place of the greatest transaction in human history. And he was doing his greatest act on earth. And at the same time, uttered the greatest words on earth. So follow with me right now. Jesus was nailed to the cross at about nine o'clock in the morning. He hung there for six hours until three in the afternoon. And for the first three hours in the morning, he said three things. And all of them were about other people. And none of them were about himself. And he first, his first statement to, do, to those who persecuted him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then his second statement was to one of the two criminals dying next to him. He said, truly, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. And his third statement was to his beloved mother, Mary was at the cross. And he said, woman, behold your son. He was pointing to John. And then to John, his disciple, he said to John, behold your mother. And then at 12 noon, a darkness that lasted three hours fell over the entire land, a mysterious darkness, and all was silent. And at that moment, he cried out, his false statement to his heavenly father in a loud, hoarse, rough and dry voice. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the last three statements, the fifth one, of being overcome with deep thirst, he exclaimed, I thirst. And followed by the sixth statement, after receiving the drink of the sour wine, he said, it is finished. That's when he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And in the recorded seventh last statement, he cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last. But these are the seven last sayings of Jesus. But I want to bring to your attention the fifth saying. And the fifth saving, saying is, I thirst. Two words in English, I thirst thirst. But in the original Greek, it's actually one word with five short letters, and it's pronounced as deep sour, deep sour. Not two words, I thirst, but rather only one word, I thirst. Not iPad, not iPhone, not iPod, but I thirst. And when Jesus made this statement, he wasn't talking about his individual needs, but the needs of the world. He wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking of us. He was to drink this cup of suffering. And he had prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, yet not as I will, but as you will. He was praying that this cup of suffering would pass away from him. But he said, no, not as I will, but as you will. And there on the cross, he was thinking of all of us. And of the, all the seven sayings on the cross, where Jesus was communicating something very significant to us, these seven sayings, the most human of the statements was, I thirst. I've chosen to look at this thing because these two verses show his suffering as well as his sovereignty. Two verses. John chapter 19, verses 28 to 29. From that two verses, there are three quick things to make note of. The three things are what Jesus knew, what Jesus said, and what Jesus did. So let's look at the first one. Let's look at what he knew. John chapter 19, verse 28 says this. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. <laughs> now, there are quite a few places in the gospel where Jesus knew what people were thinking. You see, twice, once in Matthew and once in Luke, he says this, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them. <laughs> it would be very tough and very vulnerable for us if we are hanging out with Jesus, right? He would ask you to stop that thought right now. 
Now, not only that thought, but the one before that and the one after that. He knows what we are thinking. And if you remember in Matthew 26, after the Passover meal at the Mount of Olives, Apostle Peter declared that he will never disown or deny Jesus. But he did that three times. He denied Jesus three times. And after the resurrection, when Jesus confronted his good friend Peter, our Lord asked him this question three times as well. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And to the first two times, Peter's reply was simply, was simply this. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And finally, frustrated of being asked the third time, Peter said, <laughs> he was frustrated. He said, Lord, you know all things. And you know that I love you. That's the phrase. You know all things. Jesus knew every single thing leading up to the cross, that all of the scripture will be fulfilled, including this reference, I thirst. Where was he referring to? If we go to Psalm 69, verse 21, it says there, and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Now, let me explain to you what sour wine is. Sour wine is a low-grade, cheap wine drank by Roman soldiers when doing work like this. They will not drink the expensive one, but drink the low-grade one. And John chapter 19, verse 21 says, a jar full of sour wine stood there, and they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. See, the hyssop was dipped into the sour wine and given to Jesus. Now, to the Jewish ears, that meant something. Now, hyssop. Hyssop is a weed. It has a long reed and bushy at the end, as seen in this picture. It can hold on to liquid at the bushy part. And the hyssop will remind them of the Passover. When Moses told the fathers in Israel, take hyssop, dip it in blood, the blood of a lamb, and put it on top and both sides of the door frames. If all of us remember, that's Passover. And Jesus, interestingly, was dying on the feast of Passover. And just a few hundred yards away in the temple, at that point, lambs were literally being killed, and hyssop was still used in the ceremony as it is being used right now for Jesus. At that moment. Jesus knew every prophetic scripture was lined up. And I think we need to be reminded as a lesson for us that there's always two sides of the cross. One side is the human side and the other is the divine side. We see the human side with all the evil plan to kill Jesus. But we also see the divine side, the divine sovereignty that God was arranging all things to accomplish what he had planned in the first place. And both sides must be put together. And this is the Christian hope we have, that while on one hand we may be going through a difficult time, even right now, yet on the other hand, God knows, and he has a far larger plan than yours. And Apostle Peter himself said in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, this man was handed over to you. This man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. It wasn't an accident that Jesus was on the cross. It was by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, you talking about the Jewish people with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. And while the cross is a terrible thing on one side, there's another divine side where God was in complete control. It means this, God is sovereign, but you are also responsible. So the Lord can allow people to make choices while at the same time be in perfect control. And this is the lesson. And listen to this carefully. The lesson is this, the best way to live your life, the safest way to live your life is in absolute and total surrender to God and to God's plan. Let me repeat that. 
the best way to live your life, the safest way to live your life is in absolute and total surrender to God and to God's plan. So when you wake up tomorrow morning, you may say, as many of you have said, and prayed, good morning, Holy Spirit. But really, you don't know what the day will be like. You may have some plans, but he may interrupt your plans. How about if we add this line to good morning, Holy Spirit? Add this line, Lord, I have some plans for today. But I want to surrender to whatever you have for me this day so that you will arrange all things to accomplish all things according to your will. Well, all things could mean a cross or a crown. Whether it means something seemingly bad or something good. You see, our God is a God of both the calm when everything is going well and God of the crisis when everything seems to go wrong. Well, Jesus himself knew what was coming, right? What did he say? I thirst. See, the cross is a cruel form of execution invented by the Persians and perfected by the Romans. And one of the physiological results of crucifixion is dehydration caused by the loss of bodily fluids. It is also a slow death up to three days. And sometimes out of pity, the Roman soldiers will break the legs of the victims so that they will suffocate as they can no longer lift up their bodies with their legs to breathe. So it was possible that Jesus had not had a drink for 18 hours since the last supper with his disciples. He was arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane and brought before trials. Not one trial, not two trials, but six trials, three religious ones and three secular ones. He was on his feet, no doubt, for the whole time. And finally, when Pilate took him and had him beaten, flogged, enormous loss of blood, so bodily fluids were leaving his body. Now, he's on the cross for six hours. So are you surprised when he cried out, I thirst, because he was in extreme thirst. And that is as human as it gets. And that is why I think we can relate to this statement more than any other statements. I thirst is the most natural of the seven statements. We can all relate to that. You may have already thought about your thirst a few times today, right? That's being human. And it's ironic actually to hear Jesus say, I thirst, because he's also the same one saying, he is the living water. Now, why is this important? You see, traditionally, we are good in defending the deity or the divinity of Christ. We are very comfortable with the fact that he's God. We get a little uncomfortable dealing with his, his humanity. It seems like a disconnect, that he's really powerful, but like all of us in the humanity, he's also weak. It's hard for us to appreciate and understand what God came down to earth to become like us so that we can identify with him. You see, we cannot say to Jesus that he doesn't understand how we feel or what we have experienced. While on earth, he got tired, he got thirsty, he was wounded, he was bloodied, he was betrayed, he was persecuted, he was slapped, he was kicked. He went through every imaginable suffering and finally died. And so the first heresy of first, or the first false doctrine of the Christian church was really about the denial of his humanity. And some of you who are Bible students would know this word, Gnosticism. It's false teachers claiming that Jesus didn't really have a physical body. But this little statement, I thirst, not only show us his humanity, but also his humility. See, Jesus in his divinity knew all things. So he knew all things and he said, I thirst. Now, not only did he know what he said, but now this is what he did. Years later, the apostle Paul penned these words in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. And he says that, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. That means he chose to humble himself. 
That means he became a man. And this is God stooping down this low, humbling himself to this point where he would say, I thirst. And that is why that statement is so significant. You should probably know this was not the first time they offered him a drink on the cross. This actually was the second time. The first time was recorded in Matthew 27 verse 34 when he was offered sour wine mixed with gall. Now he refused the drink the first time because the gall would dull his pain. But he wanted to experience the full effect of the suffering on the cross. And so when he was offered sour wine without the gall the second time, when the reed or the hyssop went near his lips, he was actually tasting death. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says it this way, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. And so at 12 noon, the darkness came. There was separation from God, the father from his son. And that is why he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And here Jesus was experiencing the intense thirst with the darkness. What does that sound like? To me, it sounded like hell. Jesus tasted hell because hell is a place of eternal darkness, eternal separation from God, of eternal thirst, burning thirst without satisfaction. It is a spiritual death. And on the cross, God the Father treated Jesus as if he had committed every sin, committed by every person who had ever lived. That includes you and I. This is the doctrine of substitution. And then God imputed righteousness to us. He declared us righteous. And this is the doctrine of atonement. So every person, let me close by saying this. Every person has a deep spiritual thirst. You see, we can have all the I apps in our life for individuality, and inspiration. You know what? It will come to nothing. You will never be thirsty only when you install this app called I Thirst in your life. And this app, I Thirst, simply means a desire to thirst after the things of God. And here's what Jesus said to the woman at the well. And I'll close with this. In John chapter 4, verse 13 says, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. May we renew our hearts this Good Friday with thirst after the things of God. Let us pray. Lord, we have taken drinks from so many different wells. And they may be fun for a while, but they just don't last. They don't bring satisfaction. Put the desire in us, the thirst after you, and not the things of the world. We are humbled that this invitation is given to us every day to drink from well of living water. Teach us each day to say, good morning, Holy Spirit, not my will, but your will be done. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.